and welcome to the ninth annual, good evening, and welcome to the ninth annual Bisexual Book Awards, the virtual arts reading meeting. Reading. I would like to introduce one of the hosts to you this evening, the founder and director of the Bisexual Book Awards and the Bi Writers Association, Sheila Lambert. She is also the editor of the groundbreaking anthology, Best Bi Short Stories, and is working on the first anthology of bisexual poetry. Sheila is the reason we have a bisexual book awards. She decided we needed one so that she went out and made one. And this is now our ninth annual bisexual book awards season. So I think it's a very good decision. Sheila's been doing bi and LGBTQ activism and organizing in New York for 30 years now. Wow, that's a long time. <laughs> we don't have the time to tell you everything she's done. But there's more about Sheila on our website at bywriters.org. All right, Sheila. Hey. Tony, can you put bywriters.org in the chat? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, every time one of those comes around, it's just something to put in the chat. Yep. Uh, OK. Well, I've known Donna Red since 1991, when we were both in the bisexual women's group at the LGBT Center, founded in New York, founded by a woman named Tamara. Uh, my co-host Donna Red is the executive director of Sistas in Truth, in Search of Truth, Alliance and Harmony, or Sista, for short. They are a 29 year old women of color organization that has been around since 1991. Mm -hmm. Formerly known as Bisexual Women of Color, SISTA over the years has provided a safe space for all women who come through their doors, whether they identify as bi or lesbian or not. She's been an activist since the 1980s people. Yeah. She received <laughs> The Brenda Howard Award, as well as a citation from PFLAG in 2012, along with other awards from other LGBT organizations. Anything you'd like to add, Donna? Yeah, sure. Um, first, I'd like to say congrats to all the finalists performing tonight, and I want to wish you luck in the awards. Right off the hat, right off the hat, rock, rocking always, rocking always. And speaking of hashtags, if you are live tweeting tonight's program, please follow and tag us on Twitter at Buy Book Awards and use the hashtags Buy Book Awards, Buy Writers, Bisexual Books, Bisexual Books Awards, and Buy Visibility Books. And we have some beautiful folks out here tonight. I want to see what's going on. Let's have a great time. <laughs> okay, so uh, Donna? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah. Think this next part is on you. Oh, okay. Tony Johnson identifies as he and him. Hi, Tony. Originally from Montana, is a freelance um, custom designer who works as a full time project manager at a Broadway custom shop in New York City. His bisexual activism focuses on creating bi sensitive spaces. He began hosting annual bi family potluck picnics. And in New York since 19 since 2018, and is currently a part of Bi Request leadership. Hey, Tony. Speaking of which, I noticed that one of your picnics is tomorrow. Oh. Yeah, I just got to notice. Yeah. Hope you're up, you're up for that after all night with this. Oh, you I will not. be. What? I will be. Everybody else, just meet me there. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, um, Tony has been my partner in producing this event ever since it went viral, and I'm very grateful to him for making it work. I am coming to you from the Bisexual Sexual Book Awards Library, aka my living room, where all the <laughs> books are double stacked. I think you can see some of them behind me. A lot of books. <laughs> there's yeah there's also some over here there's another little bookcase there's a big bookcase in the hallway and then there's books kind of all around the crown 
of my bed. So you're the truly biographer. <laughs> yeah. There's this books. Oh, and there's a pile of books on my vanity. There's just books sprouting piles everywhere. Uh, so where where was I? Um, well, the books are, are pretty much all double stacked. So there's twice as many as it appears. Uh, and we have more bisexual books in our collection than any library in the world. Wow. That's uh, amazing. <laughs> yeah. The, the Bi Writers Association organizes the annual bisexual book awards, including our multi arts reading. Not only do they hunt down and outreach books for submission, and they also recruit and supervise 40 judges, but they are also the foremost voice promoting bisexual books, bi plus writers, bisexual writing, and bi themed arts and culture in the USA. They work to dispel myths and stereotypes about bisexuality and have organized a book club, open mics, panels, a summit, film programs, educational workshops, and even in-service trainings. They provide networking for bi plus pan fluid writers in all aspects, journalism, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, songwriting, erotica, plays, and TV and movie scripts. As we mentioned, they have the most extensive library in the bisexual of bisexual books anywhere in the world, as you can see. I, we're also announcing two new programs tonight. Isn't that right, Sheila? Yes, we will be, and I'm very excited about them. But we're gonna tackle that a little bit later. And right now I wanna tell you about this year's Spotlight on Fiction. A couple of years ago, we had an influx of poetry submissions. So we featured all the poetry finalists on our program. This year, we had some amazing and unique fiction submissions creating settings we haven't seen before in bisexual fiction. So we brought most of them to our program. Oh, look at that. Uh, I can't stop myself. Great. The word them was there twice. Them? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Donna will be introducing the first one. So take it away, Donna. All right, thank you very much. Okay, we're leading off with the book from the fiction category starting, Starting Days, Starting Days by Rowan Hayaso Buchanan. I hope I'm saying the name right. Uh, the Overlook Press Abrams, a gorgeously wrought novel, variously about love, mythology, uh, mental illness, Japanese beer. Okay, and the times we need to seek out milder psychological climates. Rowan Hayasho Buchanan's Starling Days, written in exquisite prose, rich with lightly ironic empathy, is a complex and compelling book, work of fiction by a singularly gifted young writer. Hi there, how you doing? I am good, thank you, how are you? Um, okay, I hope I'm not butchering up your name. I'm just, um, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just like reading it and trying to make sure I'm saying it right. <laughs> it's absolutely fine. It's Rowan Hisayo Buchanan, but it looks... There are many names in the world, and it's absolutely fine. Okay. Just want to make sure you, you're okay with that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. So tell us what's going on with you. Um, well, I'm based in the UK right now, and I'm actually going to be reading from the British edition of my book, um, because okay. uh, that is the one I have. And okay. so, oh, okay. I thought I heard a sound somewhere on Zoom, but I don't All think right. it. Hmm. Oh. So should I read a bit? Sure, read something. Read something from the yeah, expert. Great. Um, okay, so Sheila asked that we pick a very bisexual section of this book. So I'm going to read a bit in which Mina, one of the two main characters, is thinking a bit about her past. She has been with her husband, Oscar, for many, many, many years. And although she's always known she was bisexual, she's never acted on it. 
but due to a recent sort of suicide attempt, their marriage has entered in very, very tricky waters. And into all of this, she meets a woman she's particularly interested in and who charms her. And they're about to have their first ever coffee date. So. The sound of recorded piano music burbled from the cafe's open window. Mina closed her eyes to better feel the sun. A breeze ran through the tree and the leaves applauded. She did not want to check her phone. It might tell her Phoebe wasn't coming. She eased one eye open. Mina told herself that the moment she was sure Phoebe wouldn't come, Phoebe would arrive. She wondered how long it took to push out all hope. Was the memory of hoping a form of hope? The question was overblown. This was, after all, just tea with a woman and a dog. It was so long since a girl had made Mina feel like this. Mina's first crush was the first girl to get breasts in their year at school. She'd worn her top three buttons undone, a mole perched above her cleavage. It was the color of a park bench gone dark with rain. Mina had spent three years wanting to kiss them all, to feel the gentle bud of it on her bottom lip. She never spoke to the girl. The girl, now a woman, had recently been profiled in Forbes for a feature on young professionals. Staring at the magazine, Mina had tried to map where the mole was hiding. The second was Mina's roommate in freshman year. This girl talked in her sleep. She wore fake eyelashes to class, but didn't shave her legs all winter. No one's going to see them, the girl always said. The roommate had nightmares, and afterwards she'd crawl into Mina's bed, wearing only boxer shorts and a loose t-shirt. The hairs tickled Mina's legs and made her think of coral fronds reaching out for her skin. It was that year that Mina had first thought of her own topiary as optional. The bed was boosted two feet to make room for Mina's books, shoes and cereal bars underneath. On the thin mattress, they spooned precariously. Later, that girl found a real girlfriend to cuddle in the night, and Mina wondered, why not me? The third was studying jewellery at the art school, a tall girl with two lip rings. She made tiny glass abstracts that seemed too delicate to wear. She'd asked Mina to model a pair of earrings, and Mina had felt those careful fingers raise a blush on each lobe. The feeling had been so intense that she'd fidgeted, jiggling toes and drumming fingers. The girl had had to ask her to sit still. Mina had been so full of longing that she was sure if she said anything at all, the girl would run and run and never look back. At a party hosted in that girl's room, Mina had met Oscar. She told him about all these women over a dinner of pizza in his dorm room. He'd smiled indulgently. Sometimes as they fucked, he described another woman touching Mina. He described the things that that other woman might do with lips and blindfolds, as fantastical as bodice ripping. In cafes, he'd lean towards Mina and ask, her? Nodding towards a swishing skirt. Mina had never done anything about it, so it wasn't quite real to him. She guessed it never would be. Phoebe must have forgotten the meeting. Mina thought of the quiet filling her apartment. She'd go back. She'd meditate. Wasn't that what crazy people did when they were trying to become uncrazy? Hi. Phoebe was followed by a hillock of fur. As it got closer, Mina saw the flapping tongue. Phoebe looped a leash around the chair. Should Mina stroke the animal? It looked suspiciously up at her. They take orders at the counter, Phoebe said. Can I get you anything? And so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.
that was, uh, I can't even think of the word, is very uh, moving and kind of catches someone's, you know, inner thoughts, kind of trying to feel out who they are, who they're attracted to, who they could fall in love with. Um, very cool. Okay. So thank you, Rowan. And um, from the mystery category comes The Better Liar by Tannen Jones, uh, published by Ballantyne, an imprint of Penguin Random House. Um, Leslie Flores has the perfect life, a loving husband, a happy newborn, and a New Mexico home straight out of a magazine. She's been the perfect daughter too, taking care of her ailing father in his final days. But Leslie has a dark secret and it's an expensive secret to keep when she discovers she won't receive a penny of her inheritance unless she finds her estranged sister, Robin. She sets out to track her down. Instead, upon arriving at Robin's apartment, Leslie discovers her body. Just as Leslie begins to panic, she meets a charismatic and aspiring actress named Mary who bears a striking resemblance to Robin and has every reason to leave her past behind. The two women make a bargain. Mary will impersonate Robin for a week in exchange for Robin's half of the cash. Neither realizes how high the stakes will become when Mary takes a dead woman's name. Tannen Jones grew up in Texas and North Carolina. She has a degree in American history and spent several years editing law and criminal justice textbooks. A queer author, she writes about queer women in dark spaces. Jones now lives with her partner in New York where she writes to the sound of her neighbor's piano. The Better Liar is her debut novel. Tannen? Hi, thank you so much, Sheila. And um, Rowan, that was, that was beautiful. Um, very hard to follow that. Um, this is The Better Liar. Um, uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, and I'm gonna be reading from chapter 25. Um, this is from Robin, the dead sister's perspective. Um, she has her own uh, sections interspersed throughout the book, reflecting on her life. She didn't even know she wanted me. That was what was so appealing about Nancy. I'd lost Leslie, Grandma Betty died, my father turned further inward like a snail. But in those absences, the boys started offering themselves to me, one after another, and I accepted again and again. I felt voracious, like I could eat a dozen and it wouldn't be enough. I liked the way they died to touch me, suffering tremors down their skinny, ropey arms, giving off that hothouse smell. But the look in their eyes was all wrong. A brief startled yawp, like when you turn the flashlight on the raccoon. I thought there had to be something more to it than that. It was there in Nancy's eyes the first time she saw me outside the schoolyard. A little pained grimace, totally involuntary. She wasn't even aware she'd done it. She saw me, wanted me, denied herself immediately. The next second it was gone, replaced by confusion. Why are you staring at me? I couldn't help myself. I smiled, completely charmed. In a single glance, she'd given more of herself to me than any of the boys I'd slept with. A stranger one second and the next, I knew more about her than her own family. Now I understood what the problem had been with the boys I'd slept with before. They were too aware of their own desires. Their knowledge made them feel entitled to me as if having seen me, they already owned me. When I gave in, it was nothing more than what they had expected. Giving myself to Nancy was so much more rewarding. She had never allowed herself to want any girl so I could not be just any girl. To her, I was the only girl or the only one who mattered. This is how easy it was with Nancy. A few weeks later, I saw her in the girl's bathroom washing her hands. Hi, I said, going over to her, leaning on the next door sink. Hi. Nancy shrank a little as she reached for a paper towel, too conscious of our reflections in the mirror above the sink. She was barely five feet, bony, with a boyish quality that caused her church issue khaki skirt to sink oddly on her slim hips. Beside her, I looked titanic. Even my teeth were bigger. I'm Robin. I stuck out my hand. Nancy, she said, trying to shake, but I only held her hand in mine, 
looking at our fingers wrapped around each other as if it were the nicest thing that I had ever seen. The air changed around us. When I looked up, I saw that Nancy's face had changed too. She wasn't afraid of me any longer. She was afraid for me, for us. In half a second, we had become conspirators, keepers of the same secret. Nancy gave me everything I wanted. We kissed in the girls' bathroom at lunch, shoved into a single stall. I stopped her in the middle, brushed her bangs back from her face. Wait, I said. She froze, her eyes focused on mine, tracking every minuscule change in expression. I thought, if I blink, she'll cry. I imagined myself licking off her tears. Her sisters didn't know at first. No one knew. We fucked with our hands over each other's mouths. She called me almost every night, compulsively. For my part, I couldn't get enough of how badly Nancy wanted me. Me, specifically, not the girlness of me, the headless story I became in boys' mouths. In Nancy's mouth, I only ever tasted myself. I was the first person Nancy had ever slept with, but she was the first partner I'd fought with, really fought. In a way, it was the same thing, a means to stick your fingers in. You never knew exactly what someone was like in bed or in a fight until you were in it with them, and once you had the feel of them, they were yours forever, yours in a deep, secret way. They kept their peace of mind at your pleasure. You had only to stroke them correctly, and they became your little animal again, purring or scratching. After a while, I think she hated me for knowing her like that. I wasn't careful with her. I can see that now. Still, she made herself naked for me again and again, told me she loved me, let me lick the salt from her. There was something insubstantial to me. I felt I didn't exist until I could see my effect on her. Did she know that? Maybe it's only my memory. I'm getting dimmer, as ghosts do. Better. That was great. Yeah. That was wonderful. Thank you, Tanan. Thank you, Tanan. Oh, me again. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been trying to get the awards in order. Um, thank you, Tana. That was very, you could really get that wom woman's or that girl's at that point in her life character from what you wrote. And that, that same, you know, time in their life of being Oh, I can't remember the phrase for it because my brain is turning Swiss cheese, but um, coming of age, that's it. Coming of age into bisexuality, into liking a girl. Okay. So by request is a very important by group here in New York that I've been a member of since its second meeting in 1994. Tony is on the leadership of By Request. So Tony, besides your picnic, which you might wanna mention in more depth again, uh, could you please tell us what By Request has been up to lately? Sure. First, I'll start off with my picnic. Uh, Tomorrow from one to six in Central Park by Diana Ross Playground, we'll be having a Bi Plus family picnic. Uh, there are gonna be COVID restrictions involved because that's how we got our permit for the, the spot. So those will be still in, we'll, we'll be observing those. Um, but come on down to Central Park and see you all there. Again, from one to six. Uh, now about by request, uh, by request has existed in one form or another since the early 1990s, where a community-based support and discussion group that also has started hosting special social events such as game nights, by plus trivia, and speed dating friending to name a few. Our all volunteer run groups group serves the New York City metro area and is open to all bi plus identifying folk and our allies. We're folks who've been there and know what it's like to be ostracized, set aside, and erased as bisexual plus people. We identify as pansexual, 
same gender loving, sexually and affectionately fluid, ace and arrow, and more. We are multi-generational, multi-racial, many gendered and variously sexed. We are uniquely challenged and able in many different ways. Uh, we work toward the realization of our collective liberation. You can find us online uh, on Meetup, Facebook, Twitter, and Eventbrite. I'll drop those in the chats. Uh, now, Donna, I think <laughs> it's time for you to announce our tongue twister of the evening. Yeah, I see. <laughs> okay, now, um, I'm going to announce the next the next group. Next, um, I'm going to announce this. Take it in love. Please take it in love. Um, bisexuality in Europe. Sexual citizenship, romantic relationships, and bi identities. Edited by Emil Malipard and Renate Bumgartner Rutledge. Rutledge. <laughs> okay. This book, edited by Emil and Renate, is the first of its kind that brings together state of the art research from Europe on bisexual, plurisexual people. Contributors range from established scholars such as Mickey Hayfield and Christian Kaisi to early career researchers at Anuka Rapai and Nicole um, Bereda, Breda, as well as PhD candidates Robert Renee Viet Breitveld and Zainab you know what? <laughs> Pay God not best said. Okay. <laughs> These various academic back backgrounds, example, anthropology, geography, psychology, and sociology make it an exciting interdisciplinary exploration of European work on bisexuality, plurisexuality. All chapters deal with bisexual theorizing and or empowering material on the everyday realities of bisexual, pansexual, or border, broader, plurisexual people. Dr. Emil Malipard from the Netherlands published widely on the everyday lives of bisexual, plurisexual people and on the interwovenness of online and offline spaces. He organized the first European Bisexual Research Conference in 2016, a journal of bisexual, bisexuality special issue on international research frontiers and guidelines for bi-inclusive policies. Dr. Renate Bumgartner is a postdoctoral researcher in sociology of sexualities and sociology of science and technology at the University of Tumbingen. Her work on bisexuality has been published in Psychology of Sexuality Review. She was the lead author of the research corner of Robin Robin Oak magazine Bisexual Women Quarterly. Emil and Renate, excuse me, but I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to butcher up your names, okay? Please take it in love. <laughs> so whoever wanna go first. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Donna, for this uh oh, intro for those difficult names we had to uh okay. <laughs> include in our book. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Well thank you. Um, we will now read some parts of Renate's uh, chapter. Okay, great. Bisexual women's accounts of internalized by negativity in non-monogamous relationship narratives. And we will just do a duo reading today. Yeah, thank you, Donna, for the for the very kind introduction. So this is the book. We are very proud that uh, Rutledge actually uh, let us publish it. And it's in, in indeed the first book of its kind. It's the first uh, book that brings together research from various European countries. And so and it's also open, open access. So you can download it from the Rutledge uh, homepage just for free, just download it without paying nothing. So this uh, went under the open access um, uh, scheme of, of Rutledge. Okay. okay. <laughs> so what made you decide to write the book? I'm kind of curious. <laughs> Renate? Who, who made us decide to write the book? Emil. <laughs> oh, okay. All right now. So what made both of you decide to put this book together? Emil, why don't you tell me a little bit about the book? Yeah, no, I think it was like, a couple of years ago that, that we realized that there was so much work done in the USA 
in okay. the UK, in Canada, and even in Australia. And there's not so much done in, in Europe. And most people are working together, are working independently in their own countries without support groups, without their networks. Wow. So we try to, to bring them together and to make a book and make, hopefully, a good publication for the next generation of researchers who can hopefully more easily find their information, okay. more easily uh, find the networks and the resources for their uh, own careers. Okay, that's great. That's wonderful. We really need that, especially when people, especially coming out, being bisexual, want to know what bisexuality is all about, whether it's men or women, or whether they identify, don't identify. There's something out here, and I think that's wonderful for both of you to come up with this great book. Okay, so it's also on Amazon as well. If I want to go and buy it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. It is. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's wonderful. Okay, Sheila. All right, so go ahead and do some reading. Yeah. <laughs> so I will just start with the, uh, with the part of my chapter and then we will like uh, switch. Okay. So this ch um, so chapter is about bisexual women's accounts of internalized bi, bi negativity in non-monogamous relationship narratives. That's the title. Mm. This chapter draws from the first Austrian qualitative study to be published on bisexuality. I interviewed women who had either had sexual and or romantic relationship experiences with more than one sex or gender, or defined themselves as having a plurisexual identity. My first example, Johanna, had experienced relationships with different genders. She described her then recent dating experience with a woman as following. So a quote from uh, Johanna. Um, also, I never told Julia that I date a man because I somehow have the feeling it would hurt her somehow double. Because they have the feeling I only would have played with them and actually wanted a guy, or I don't know what and then. It was consecutively like that, that I actually concealed the sex, and maybe they had their own thoughts on that matter. However, up to today, I really don't know what to do about it. In this interview, Johanna added that this was the first time in her life she had tried to date both men and women at the same time. She would have liked to be open about it. However, with women, she was more reticent than with men. She expected women to be an accepting of her openness to more than one gender, one, one sex or gender at the same time. Mm -hmm. She anticipated that by, by negative reaction that her date would assume she actually preferred men which makes sense in a society with, where um, straightness is seen as a default, compulsory, and naturalized sexuality. Johanna's reaction may have been intensified by the fact that she was also considering being the monogamous. Uh, the main topic in the sequence is being afraid of rejection mm -hmm. because of one's non-monogamous bisexual identity. And in the end, she chose the strategy of concealment. Johanna's case is a good example of the challenges that arise for someone with an identity, the intersection of bisexuality and non-monogamy, dealing with a twofold outing as a bisexual person, as a person preferring non-monogamous relationships. It increases the challenges at the start of the intimate relationship in her experience. Her ambivalence about coming out is well attested to in literature describing the struggles of bisexuals come out in a society full of anti-bisexual discourses and practices. The second example, Asha, is an example of a woman dealing with her sexuality in an emancipatory way. Her way of adopting polyamory as an inspiring concept for her identity and love life is one step further towards self-determined agency. She says, it was like a revelation when I realized I'm no asshole. I'm no asshole that always wants to play around. I'm just in the wrong relationship concept because I always thought there is just one. And that was just an aha experience for me. That was really cool. Asha echoed here the outside view of her ex-partners, who she told us did not have a positive opinion of her. However, she did not blame herself, feeling that she was a bad person because she followed her attractions. On the contrary, when she learned about the concept of polyamory from one of Vienna's bisexual support groups, it was like a revelation to her. I argue that in Asha's case, the adoption of a polyamorous identity is an act of empowerment. 
The example provides evidence that women experiencing the emancipatory potential of non-monogamy are less likely to link bisexuality and unfaithfulness in a, re in a way that reflects internalized bi-negativity. In this very small part of the discussion, in these two examples, we see that choosing to live at the intersection of bisexuality and non-monogamy proved to be challenging. Nevertheless, Anna, Asha, and other women in the study experienced non-monogamy relationship forms as empowering. This work also shows how connected the challenges of bisexual identities and non-monogamy living people are when it comes to allegations of promiscuity. Therefore, this work reiterates that the call for activist synergies between bisexual and non-monogamous or polyamorous communities. Mm. That's interesting. Okay. Sheila, thank you so much. Yay. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for your reading and for, for doing this research um, and bringing this research to light. You know, the more books like yours that focus on the topic of bisexuality, whether it's in Europe, Australia, Sweden, North America, um, you know, the more we will learn. And uh, it's very exciting to me that more and more research is being done, focusing on us because that was never the case before. Um, well, Fritz Klein and no one else. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, Exciting to me when I see that this is happening. Now, let me see if I can find my notes of what I'm supposed to do next. Okay, so without our judges, there would be no bisexual book awards. We recruit around 40 judges annually to read and evaluate the books in each category. Uh, they review, discuss, and vote on the books using our main three main criteria to determine the finalists and the winners. Our three main criteria are uh, the quality of overall writing, the quality of writing about bi plus, bisexual, pansexual, fluid characters, bisexual themes, or bisexual material. Um, and also the quantity of bisexual material. If you have a great scene where bisexuality is present, uh, that's great. But if that's all you have in your book, no matter how well written it is, it's not gonna be enough. So it's sort of like a three-legged stool that has to be well balanced and that's what we're looking at um, in terms of who, which books we want to make finalists or winners. And, you know, it's, they're very, they really discuss back and forth um, their opinions and the qualifications of the book. Um, it's, they really do a great job. And we're working towards a vision of what a good bisexual book looks like. Um, so it's an ongoing discussion every year. And we always get returning judges and some new judges. And if you love to read, if you are a fast reader, if you're a librarian, a teacher, an academic, a writer, if you have experience writing book reviews, even if it's just on Goodreads or Amazon or your blog, if you like free bisexual books, you might be our next judge. So just go to the Write Me page of our website at bywriters.org and send us an email. If you, you know, click on Write Me and send an email from there, that comes direct to me. So um, I will, you know, I'll look over your, your email and, uh, 
you know, find out, well, it would be good if you could put the four categories that you are the most interested in judging. And uh, we start season 10 in the fall. It's our 10th anniversary. I can't believe it. The first year, I didn't even put first annual because I wasn't sure if this thing was going to go. <laughs> it was sort of a test year. I didn't do it the second year either. I mean, now I went back and did it on our website, but you know, I was just like, who knows if this thing is going to work out, but now we're next season is our 10th anniversary. And I'm very psyched about that. Okay. So on our next book, which is from our fiction spotlight, uh, is you exist too much. Oh, wait, is she here? Zaina Arafat? Tony, do we have Zaina? No? Okay. I don't see her. All right. Well, if she comes later, we'll stick her in later. Okay. So um, let's go to the next book, um, which Donna will be introducing. Oh, no, not a book. Musician. Ah. The first musician of the evening. Yay! <laughs> okay. All right, Sheila. Um, yes, we have waited a long time to get Ann Heaton on our program. She lives in Milwaukee, so that wasn't possible. But now that we're vir virtual, we thought it would be our big chance to get her. Heaton is a singer, songwriter, and pianist who has captured audience imaginations for over 15 years. 15 years. Hey, girl. Um, and then her songs are all... I turned turn tender, tender bars. Whoa, whoa, I'm getting an echo. Is that just me or is that everybody? Okay. It's fine. Continue. It's okay. good. Okay. Um, Keep going. According to Washington Post, um, she's been featured by the New York Times podcast, toured widely in North America, and shared the stage with artists such as Jewel and Max and jazz drummer Max Roach. She teaches at Berkeley College of Music and is the founder of Soul Song School Online Songwriting Program. Say that five times. <laughs> she loves coffee. <laughs> she loves coffee, Lake Michigan, and being the mom of two free-thinking daughters. Give it up for Ann Heaton. Yay! <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Okay. Um, Gonna start with a song um, about uh, taking risks. Hopefully, the sounds okay. I'm ready to be afraid. I'm ready to jump. I'm ready. Yeah. You might as well 
Sometimes life is hard on us, and sometimes the things that are hardest on us sometimes lead to things that feel good. So this is called the celebration song. I don't reheat my coffee. I put a brand new pot on when I drop my child at preschool. I might have a sparkly dress so if I'm on a dry hive, if I want to fly high, who's going to stop me? No one but me. And what if I don't? I feel celebration going on. Celebration, celebration. I feel a celebration going on. Celebration, celebration. I feel the bottoms of my feet walk into a pulse on the street on our warming globe. Trees rise to absorb the storm. They reach up to the sky. Pine and oak for you and I. Green waving at the blue. In the CO2, thank you. I feel celebration going on. Celebration, celebration. I feel celebration going on. Celebration, celebration. I feel celebration going on. Celebration, celebration. I feel celebration going on. Think how lost I felt and to this perfect moment all the had to go right and wrong for me to come here and own it how unlikely we'd meet make up after fights that I take the 59th street bridge to you one night that you and I'd roll a crown Vic on black ice I'd be hit by a drunk driver but somehow survive who I flew across a freeway I didn't have a scratch my spirit shifted up above my head and it was because of that that later I knew when I walked through hard times I had a spirit to turn to can you feel it can you feel it rising Oh, how my grandpa showed me the ballads of Ireland My friend Motley, the music of Harlem How I always preferred, though I didn't know it then The music of the oppressed over those oppressing them How my mom got me all those piano lessons Damn, thank you 
Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Rising up So I could make my music shared in my own voice How I had to meet the wrong man to make a better choice How it all had to burn down so I could rebuild my life And have these two daughters Who like ice cream and watermelon best Sell a red wagon rising in new blue dresses They feel it Rising up And maybe humanity won't survive But I'm gonna make the most of my time Like Paul McCartney said Maybe you've been waiting your whole life For this moment to arise Like Thich Nhat Hanh lived peace in Vietnam He kept rebuilding and rebuilding He helped Martin Luther King over here As they kept marching and marching Can you feel it? 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 Rising up, can you feel a celebration going on? Celebration, celebration. Feel a celebration going on. Celebration, celebration. Feel a celebration going on. Celebration, celebration. I feel a celebration going on. Celebration, celebration. If I wanna fly, if I wanna drive. Who's gonna stop me? No one but me. Who's gonna stop me? No one but me. If I wanna drive, if I wanna fly, who's gonna stop me? No one but me. And what if I don't? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that was, you know, so moving. So touching, you know, the first one, as well as the second. And fun, you had me dancing in my seat <laughs> for the second song. song. Thank you, Sheila, for having, having us. Um, yeah, I waited a long time to get you on our program, <laughs> including last year when she injured herself and couldn't couldn't perform, so I'm glad we were able to uh, to get. Are you okay now? I'm I'm fine now. Yes, thank okay, you. Good. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's good. That's good to know. Okay, so I want to tell you all the authors here about a really great tool, um, specifically made for authors. Uh, they recently became our first sponsor because they approached us and um, on LinkedIn of all places, which I don't spend a lot of time on, but um, I, you know, I agreed to have them as a sponsor because I think their product can really help authors. Uh, it's called Plotter. And uh, instead of writing all your scenes and your characters down on index cards, because, you know, you can move them around. If things are developing in one direction, you can, you know, switch things around. But uh, instead of writing all your scenes and characters down on index cards to try to keep track of them, you can have your desk back, your dining room table back, your coffee table back, your rug back, wherever you're laying out those cards and just put it all on plotter and get your apartment or your house back. Ever had your cat or your dog jump on your index cards and scatter them to the four winds? Can't find all of them after that. Uh, save all your info on plotter and never have this happen again. Plotter will keep track of it for you. And you can, you can, move everything around. I mean, it's just, it's incredibly flexible. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I haven't had a chance to use it myself yet, but I was so impressed when I was reading about it. And um, I watched a video and I really, if I was writing a novel, I would use this. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and they've been very supportive of us. You know, I, I really appreciate that. So um, 
Our next book comes from our spotlight on fiction, The Company Daughters by Samantha Rajaram. Samantha, are you here? She's here. I am. Uh, okay, so The Company Daughters by Samantha Rajaram follows, well, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Jana Bile. What? Yana Bale. Yana Bale. Okay. Um, follows Yana Bale, a young, poor domestic servant in the 17th century, as she follows the woman she loves to Batavia, now Jakarta, as part of a sex trafficking policy by the Dutch East India Company. Um, Samantha Rajaram is an English professor and former lawyer whose work focuses on how laws impact marginalized people. She has been published in India Currents, Catamaran, and in the South Asian women's anthology, Our Feet Walk the Sky, in 1992. Her novel is an Amazon bestseller in LGBT and historical literary fiction. So Sam, let's hear what you picked out for us today. Great, thank you so much, Sheila. <clears throat> so I'm going to read a short section from the beginning of my book, The Company Daughters, which is set in 1620 Amsterdam during the Dutch East India Company's colonization of Java, Indonesia. And here the main character, Jana, is working as a servant for the wealthy Reinst family and finds herself drawn to her employer's daughter, Sancha. Meanwhile, she's also just met a Jewish sailor and merchant named Tobias Levy, and in this scene, Tobias takes her to dinner and they go for a walk afterward. We walk silently through the alley and back into the open moonlight and I grow troubled thinking that he may expect the same of me, but he's different from the roughnecks I've known. I like his high forehead, dark brows and those open bright blue eyes. He's stronger than me for certain, but he's not the type to enjoy roughness. I've learned to spot them quickly. They have a wildness in their eyes, even if they're wealthy. Tobias looks at his boots for a moment, smiling. What is it, I ask? I was thinking that you looked so young and lovely in this light. You're an interesting woman, Miss Yana, full of thoughts. You have the look of someone living some other hidden life. At this, I'm silent and gaze at his wide, high boots instead. The worn laces, the bindings frayed. I cannot imagine him purchasing something as ordinary as boots. The style is popular among merchants, flagging at the top. Do you wear shoes when you're on deck? He laughs. I thought we were discussing your many thoughts. I blush as I often speak before thinking. Father used to cuff me for that, spinny-headed meishi, he would call me. But Tobias addresses my question with a seriousness that warms me. Boots on deck? Not always, especially when we get closer to the islands. Gets hot like a forge in that sun. Some of us strip down to our breeches just to feel the sunshine on our skins. By the time we make it there, we're so tired and hungry. The sun is all we have. He must be eager to go back there, I say. Aye, but I have work to do. I'll stay here a few days and help with the cargo, make some contacts with the merchants and managers I know. They forbid us Jews from joining the guilds, but even the smaller merchants can do well enough. And after that, off to Bruges with some of the cargo. I have contacts there. I prefer the sea to gravel roads, but this too is part of my work. We come to a brick building with a quaint turret. This is where I stay, he says. We stand before the building and I feel embarrassed, unsure of what to do. Thank you for your company, he says, without touching me. I'm both surprised and confused, having grown used to others expecting much more for far less of my time. I wish him a good night and hurry back to the Reinst house. It's late and I must wake early to see about work at the de Graffs. Later, once I'm finally lying in my uneven cot in my little attic bedroom, my thoughts return to Sancha. I imagine my lips on her skin, my hands holding her slim hips, winding her long hair around my index finger. From where do such thoughts arise? I have never been told they are evil thoughts, but I know they are. Nothing is said of women loving women, only of men and men, a grave sin, or women and men. The church condemns lust and pleasure, but still the brothels flourish at the outskirts of Amsterdam. The proprietors take in girls just past their first bleeding to do their work for two flavorless meals per day esteemed grandfathers grunting like donkeys, smelling of ale. Instead, I think of Tobias, his mouth, his hands, 
but the images escaped me, disappearing like sunlight behind the morning fog. I returned to Sancha, her white fingernails peeking over the tips, a strand of her fair hair hanging into her eyes. I have not wept in a long time, but a sweep of sadness rises from my stomach and causes a humming in my ears. I think of starlings swirling above, unfolding and folding in that way they do every autumn before they leave Amsterdam. That is how my sadness feels. I'm only a maid, hardly even a friend. The rains could replace me tomorrow if they wanted, if it weren't for their sudden misfortune and with any of the starving girls roaming down center in search of work. And still, my feelings are an unyielding stain I cannot wipe or scrape or scrub out like a mud splatter on the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was so, oh. I mean, it really exemplifies bisexuality the way you can have dual feelings, you know, for someone of the male gender, someone of the female at the same time. <laughs> and uh, the emotions that go along with it in terms of her place in the world, her class. You know, you just exemplified that beautifully. Okay, so um, the Toronto by Arts Festival is a friend of ours. They're in the arts, we're in the arts. Due to everything being virtual last year, I was able to go to a lot of their events in July and it was lots of fun. They also do events during by visibility week in September and year round late, really. I mean, I'm always seeing something from them here and there. Uh, you should definitely check them out. You can Google them or get their web address in our chat. Um, and so we have uh, another, in fact, I can't wait to see what they're gonna have this July. Um, from our spot, uh, another book from our spotlight on fiction. We now have Exile Music by Jennifer Style, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, out of Viking, which is now an imprint of, an imprint of uh, Penguin Random House, uh, based on an untold slice of World War II history. Exile Music is the captivating story of a family of Viennese Jewish musicians who flee the Nazis in Austria in 1939 to seek refuge in Bolivia, the only country that would let them in. There, they are confronted with new languages, cultures, and eventually some of the Nazis they sought to escape. While Orly and her father used music to weave together their past and present lives, Orly's mother abandoned singing she grows increasingly distant, harboring a secret that could put their entire family at risk again. When unexpected visitors arrive in their new homeland, they force Orly to choose where she ultimately belongs. Some 20,000 Jewish refugees found their way to Bolivia during the war years, many of them artists and musicians. Very little has been written about this community. Jennifer Style lived in Bolivia for four years, meeting some remaining survivors and their descendants. Their stories inspired her book, which Booklist, in a starred review, calls a beautiful coming-of-age tale. Moving, evocative, and well-researched, it's just sure to linger in readers' minds long after the last page has been turned. In one recent review, the Pittsburgh Jewish Chronicle wrote, in a sea of Holocaust literature, exile music stands out as wholly original and engaging. And I just want to say this book means a lot to me because I am from a Jewish background. And this is a part of my history that I never knew about. So this was like a complete revelation to me. Um, 
Jennifer Stile is the author of two previous books, The Woman Who Fell from the Sky, a memoir of her experience running a newspaper in Yemen, and The Ambassador's Wife, which was in our awards, I believe, um, a novel about a hostage crisis inspired by Stiles' experience. She currently lives in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Jennifer, is that where you are now? Um, it is where I am based, but we arrived in the U.S. last night. Oh. Oh. Um, so this is I, I, to visit my parents here. It's the first time we've been able to see them in a couple of years. So yeah, I'm currently at a, in Massachusetts. Okay. <laughs> So I'm not at home, but we are based in Uzbekistan. You have lived in some places where probably none of us have been. Um, so that's pretty amazing. So why don't you take it away <laughs> and read us your excerpt? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I've loved hearing your work. Um, I'm going to read two super brief pieces from Exile Music. The first is the beginning. Um, and unfortunately, my most favorite bisexual scene is the ending, which I can't read you because I want you to read the book. <laughs> so, um, all right, so here we go. Um, the, the book follows the structure of Mahler's Third Symphony. So this is the very, this is the overture. And then I'm gonna read you just the tiniest section of a scene. Uh, it starts when Orly's very young, she's around six and ends when she's in her 40s. So, When I think of Austria, I remember what a child remembers, details as vivid as the bright shards of a dream, the coffee warmed air of the kitchen, the rough fabric of my father's suits against my cheek, the chalk dust of my classroom tickling my nose, the ice crusted snow in the meadow that cut my eyebrow open when I fell the off the toboggan halfway down the slope. My Anna Lisa. My parents' voices in the kitchen as I hovered still and silent by the door, secretly listening. It was important then to listen. I remember the tang of my mother's apricot jam spread over a thick layer of butter on crusty bread, the fungal stink of my older brother's dirty sports clothing on the bathroom floor the earthy scent of the square olive oil soap that was always slipping into the sink. I remember a plum tree in our small communal courtyard that dropped its sour sweet fruit onto our terrace. They were a dark dusty purple, more oval than the green ones we would eat in Bolivia. In Vienna, Annalisa's mother collected the dropped fruits and used them to make torts. I remember my mother's voice in our parlor, starting off low and gathering the energy to soar. I remember the scent of rosin on horsehair, the vibrations of my father's viola, how I could feel the notes on my skin, even after he stopped playing and I was in bed, listening only to the silence. I remember the inky smell of my school books as I cracked their spines, the sound of Frau Fessler's ruler smashing into my desk when she caught me with a book on my lap during math class. The way the fruit gummies from vices got stuck in my back teeth so I had to pick them out with my fingernails. I remember the damp heat of Annalise's hand as she folded it with mine for the last time. I remember our neighbor's long coats decorated with flocks of badges saying only, ya. Yeah. The swastikas on every armband and flag pinned to every lapel, painted on our sidewalks. They even fell from the sky, flurries of paper spiders dropping onto our heads. I remember the newspapers my parents hid from me under sofa cushions. I remember lying awake, twisting the satiny border of my blanket in my fingers until my mother came and curled around me. I remember her breath on my neck, the ice of her fingers on my spine, stroking my skin until I drifted into dreams. The bland quotidian details, the textures of ordinary days, seared themselves most permanently, except for Annalisa. Annalisa, who was neither bland nor ordinary. Annalisa, who was more part of me than not. Our mothers had birthed themselves in the same building a week apart, and from then on, there were no divisions between us. 
The four syllables of her name were my first song. And this is from Orly's first visit to the opera with her mother, who's an opera singer. During the interval, I shook out my stiff legs as we walked to the lobby bar. My mother ordered me an apple spritz and herself a glass of champagne. I looked longingly at the cakes, but my mother said we could go to a cafe afterward. As she was paying, a woman with long glittering earrings and a spiraling tower of fair hair touched her elbow. Yulia, I thought it was you. My mother turned to greet the woman, introducing her as a singer she knew from work, but I failed to catch her name. I was distracted by another woman. Was it a woman? Just behind her. Dressed in what looked like a man's tuxedo, she had combed her short dark hair straight back. Instead of tipping her weight into one hip or wobbling on heels, she stood with her legs a foot apart, comfortable like a man. When she saw me staring, she smiled. I'm Odeon, she said, her voice warm and low as she offered me her hand. I took her dry fingers in my damp ones. Are you a girl? Odeon laughed, but my mother reached for my elbow and pinched it. Orly, Odeon, please forgive my daughter. She turned back to me. Odeon is a pianist a and a composer. Pleased to meet you, I curtsied, hoping it might make up for my rudeness. I didn't know that girls could dress like that. I didn't know that women could stand that way. The bell chimed, but we were still drinking and we had to finish quickly before the lights went down. I wanted to follow Odeon back to her seat, but she and the blonde woman quickly disappeared into the throng. Muti, how do you know her? I told you from work, she's a mezzo. No, Odeon. Ah, my mother glanced down at the program in her lap. She lives with Ilsa. They're sisters? More like roommates, I think. I thought about this. I wondered if Annalisa and I could be roommates. Why does she dress like that? Odeon, I mean. Some women like to wear trousers. Even the first lady in the United States sometimes wears trousers and Marlena Dietrich, the film star. Though I don't recommend you start, Frau Fessler would not approve. Do you think Odeon wears trousers all the time? Are there girls who do that? My mother took my hand. Ertnus, you'll find a bit later in life that there are all kinds of girls. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That's great. One of the things I love about all of these readings is just how you all use words to paint pictures. Because I'm a, I'm a visual artist and so I paint pictures with like paint and pixels, but you all paint these such vivid and rich textures and stories and places with words and it just amazes me. Thank you again, Jennifer. Um, so something I'd like to pop in and take a sec to let you all know that BICON UK 2021 will be online this year from Thursday, August 19th through Sunday, August 22nd. BICON UK is a three-day weekend-long educational and social gathering for BIPLUS people, their friends, partners, and others with a supportive interest in bisexuality. We don't all use the labels bi or bisexual, but for BICON UK, bisexuality plus is the common theme. They have both social and fun with discussions, dancing, games, music, crafting, and costume parties, as well as more serious workshops on issues around bisexuality and related topics. BICON UK is a space to be completely yourself, make new friends, catch up with old ones, all in a totally accepting atmosphere. For a link to their website, as well as a link for tickets on OutSavvy, I will be putting those links in the chat shortly. So, Donna. Hi, hi, okay. Our next book comes from the memoir category, The Fixed Stars by Molly Weisenberg. The Fixed Stars is a taunt 
electrifying memoir exploring timely and timeless questions about desire, identity, and the limits and possibilities of family. In honest and searing prose, Weisenberg forges a new path through the murk of separation and divorce, coming out to family and friends, learning to co-parent a young child and realizing a new vision of love. The result is a frank and moving story about letting go of rigid definitions and details that no longer fit and learning instead who we are, who we really are. Molly Weisenberg is the author of two best-selling books, A Homemade Life in Delancey and the James Beard award-winning blog, Orange Jet. She has written for the Washington Post, The Guardian, Savoir, and Bon Appetit. And she also co-hosts the podcast Spilled Milk with Chef Brandon Petit. Weisenberg co-founded the award-winning Seattle restaurants, Delancey and Essex. Molly, you there? I am Hi. here. Hello. Hi. The floor is yours. Hi. Thank you so much, Donna. And thank okay. you, Tony. And Sheila, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so the book that... Uh, book that I'm reading from is The Fixed Stars, which as Donna mentioned is a memoir. Um, and it opens with me um, having, been, uh, having been summoned for juror duty and assigned to the jury. And um, I, I developed this real fixation on um, a very masculine presenting female defense attorney. And I was married at the time to a man and had been for almost a decade. So, so that's where we're going to start. So this is, um, this is in the first chapter, kind of right smack in the, the jury duty portion of things. Also, I apologize for the crickets in the background. We're taking care of our daughter's uh, classroom bearded dragon for summer. And bearded dragons eat crickets. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'd had crushes since being with Brandon. A few, mostly little things, banal. We'd joke about them. For years, he nursed a crush on the actress Natalie Portman. So it was like that, safe. But I'd had another type of crush too. Other men I'd wanted without saying a word. There were only two of them, but these men loomed over us. I never called his attention to their elephantine shadows. Telling him would have made them more real, made actual people out of these dark shapes, made distractions into danger. It would have frightened us both. Instead, I chipped away at the shadows privately, interrogated them into submission. Do I want to be someone who cheats? No, I don't want to be someone who would do that. Am I willing to do that to Brandon, to not tell him? No, he doesn't deserve that. Can I get what I want by cheating without also getting what I don't want? No, always no. Even if the conclusion had been a brief yes, this fact would stop me. The lust would wear off, the sheen would dull, I knew it would. I'd still be me, just with a different set of problems. Each afternoon when the judge dismisses us, I bolt from the building, fast walk down the hill to the bus stop. My sandals slap the pavement on the downslope, left, right, left, right. Who am I, who am I, who am I? The vinyl bench seats of the bus are sticky with summer heat. I sit down, think about what to make for dinner. I've missed June. We've had to get extra babysitting this week, a cost we hadn't budgeted for. I've hardly been around. Even in the evenings, I've hardly been around. Do I remember anything we've done? Me and June, me, June and Brandon. I've been thinking about the woman in the suit. That's what I remember. But I know the answers to the questions. Do I want to be someone who does this? No. Am I willing to do this to Brandon? No. The sheen will wear off and you know it, Molly. Do I? I've never been with a woman. Does that make a difference? Maybe it does. What if it does? You'd still be you, wouldn't you? Would I? The bus is too hot. The fabric under my arms is damp. 
I'm afraid something is wrong with me, but I don't have to tell anyone. Brandon doesn't have to know. The woman in the men's suit doesn't have to know either. She has no idea that a single glance in my direction, her eyes on my skin would keep me awake all night. It's my secret and I'll keep it here with me. I can visit it whenever I want. Knowing this feels luxurious. The place where I will keep this secret is padded and dim. The feeling when you lie back in the bath and the water covers your ears. I can climb inside this feeling anytime I want, anywhere, on a bus, on a swiveling chair in a jury box, and I can think about her. No one has to know. The trial takes a week and ends on a Wednesday. We are unanimous. The defendant is not guilty. I am certain that my vote to acquit has nothing to do with the fact that I've been watching the defense attorney in the suit. I know that my desire to assert this certainty has everything to do with the same fact. But I can go home now. I can put it behind me. Across the room, I watch the defendant light up with grief, excuse me, with relief. I wonder if at some point in the near future, I will feel relief like that. For now, I will memorize her. Now she will go home back to her part of the city. I'd never seen her before a week ago and I won't see her again. The formality of the courtroom has dissolved and we're dismissed. I text Brandon to let him know I'm done. He's working near home today, so I'll take the bus. Let's meet for a quick drink, he texts. He'll meet me along the bus route with his car. Hurrah, I type, I can tell you about the trial. I walk out of the courtroom with the other jurors. Outside the front door, the air conditioning gives way to a blast of heat. My gut flips over as I see a huddle of people outside, the defense attorneys, their client, a few observers from the back of the courtroom. The defendant reaches out, squeezes my shoulder. Behind him, the woman in the men's suit is standing in the half shade of a small potted tree. She's taken off her jacket and rolled up the sleeves of her white shirt. It must have been starched at some point, but is already drooping. I'm sweating in a tank top. She steps toward me and the sun explodes off the paving tiles. I raise my hand to shield my eyes. Thanks, she says. We weren't sure how that was going to go. This is a huge relief. She's smiling and she offers her right hand. I shake it. I've looked at this hand, but now that I touch it, the moment is over so fast that I don't feel anything. It occurs to me that with my left hand up at my brow, the diamonds along my wedding band must be winking in the sun like lighthouse beacons. I cross my arms, tucking my ring finger into the crook of an elbow. I heard in voir dire that you're a writer, she says. Me too. I'm Nora, by the way. Oh, wow, I squeeze out. Sweat beads on my collarbone like a cheap necklace. What kind of writing do you do? Mostly fiction. Nora says. She's a lawyer part-time. She took this case to help a friend. She pushes her hands into her pockets and rocks on her heels. Nice, I say, and force a smile. My right eyelid twitches from squinting. Cool, she says, like a normal person. She smiles back. I've wanted this moment, thought about it for a week, but staying here takes effort. The sun is so bright it stings. My eyelid is spasming wildly now. It was nice to meet you, I manage. Maybe I'll see you around. She nods, still smiling. Thanks again, she says, but she's already pivoting on her heel, back to her client. I turn fast, hoping she hasn't seen whatever my eyelid is doing. I aim myself at the bus stop and start moving. Who am I, who am I, who am I, all the way down the hill? When I get there, I've missed the bus and the next won't come for 15 minutes. There's a crowd of men in front of the building across the street, their backs against its stone facade. I wonder if the stone feels cool in this heat. They must have been out here all day while we sat in the air conditioning. While I'm forming this thought, Nora walks past them. She slung her jacket over her shoulder and a soft-sided briefcase hangs at her hip. She lowers herself onto an empty bench at the bus stop opposite mine. Her hair is stringy with sweat and there's a shadow under her eyes 
She hasn't noticed me. I don't know what I'd do if she did. My bus pulls up at the sidewalk. In case Nora has seen me, I make a show of my eagerness to leave, my detachment from the past week. I lock my eyes onto the bus door as it passes, swivel my head extravagantly to follow it to the curb. I am a stage actor now in a play about a bus stop. I step up through the folding doors and take the first open seat on the street side where I can still see her. She leans forward, lets her hair hang, looks at the pavement. The bus lurches away from the sidewalk and I watch her get smaller until she disappears into the glare. I could have yelled to her. I could have caught her eye or she could have seen me, yelled to me across the street. In another iteration, I could have lived it differently. In some other life, I might have stood next to her in a photo. But what about Brandon? What about June? I swing like a pendulum from sadness to relief, sadness to relief. A disaster averted. It could have happened, but it didn't. The bus nears my stop and I yank the cord. I step out onto the sidewalk. The air is still warm, barely perceptible where it touches my arms. Brandon's car rumbles at the curb and I open the door and climb in. The next morning I woke up thinking about her and the morning after that. I allowed myself to do what I hadn't during the trial. I searched for her online. It didn't take me long to find her last name, a couple of photographs. Her smile was disorienting, like being blindfolded folded and spun around. I thought of a friend who'd suffered a recent bout of vertigo how he described that these tiny mineral crystals from one part of his inner ear had wound up in another part, the wrong part, so that when he looked down, they'd roll around and trick his brain into thinking the floor had tilted. That's what Nora's smile did to me. It located a feeling where it wasn't supposed to be, turned the room on end. In a book on amateur astronomy, I read that if you can identify Orion and the Big Dipper, you can use them as guideposts to find every major star and constellation visible from the Northern Hemisphere, no matter the season or time of night. I had found my stars. I had Brandon, I had June. I had only to redirect my focus, surely that was it. I had to look at them, look at us, look at me in this life. I knew who I was in this constellation beside my people. I knew how to stop this. I could interrogate my feelings for Nora into oblivion, but the questions that had been persuasive seemed useless now. Then I'd had the experience, the perspective of experience to draw on. I'd had relationships with men, enough to allow me to generalize, extrapolate, connect the dots into shapes. Here I had nothing. I'd never been with a woman. What if the view would be different there, different in ways I couldn't imagine, like the view from a galaxy a billion light years away? Constellations are, after all, a trick of perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was very... You know, when you write a memoir, you open yourself up. And, you know, you really let your readers in to your inner life in a very deep way. And uh, I appreciate that a lot. Thank you, Sheila. Um, okay, so Rory Kelly is our most frequent flyer. <laughs> she is the most generous musician who has ever played for us, performing so many damn times that she deserves a medal. Mm. And Rory, I have one for you next time I see you. Ooh, <laughs> very excited. <laughs> uh, Rory, Rory Kelly makes Lady Beast music. I'm not sure what that is. Have you coined a term or is that an actual thing? It's a thing I made up, but now I feel like it's actual. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so she makes lady beast 
music. I guess we'll find out what that is in a minute. Uh, her life's mission is to create music that inspires others to love themselves fiercely and become their own heroes. Rory's empowerment anthem, If You Teach a Bird to Sing, led her to perform at the Obama White House and earned her a top 10 staff pick from WFUV's John Platt. Rory performs weekly on her live stream, Monday Night Muses, and you can tune in every Monday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time on her Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch page. I guess we'll have that. You can put that in the chat, someone. I think Tony and, just said uh, in the chat. Her Thank new you. album, Shadow Work, is set to be released in spring 2021. And uh, the singer promises the new album will be big, dark, and 150% more witchy. <laughs> <gasps> Rory? <laughs> Hi, all. Hey. That was a, a bi event at the White House, by the way. When I got to perform, that was a bi community event. Um, and uh, it was really cool. It was the Obama White House did a bi community briefing. Um, the first and only president to invite us to speak particularly on issues that affect us. And I was just like, it was so lucky that I got to be a part of it. So this is a song called Lying Streak. It is on my new album, which is out. It's here. Um, <laughs> and uh, this song is, it's not just about coming out. I think no one understands better than a bi or a pan person how coming out is a lifelong process. Um, we, we are never done. <laughs> and it's kind of about that and about those very awkward situations that arise when we realize, oh, I have to come out again. <laughs> as well as the internal experience. This isn't really my world, 
make me nervous This isn't my real life This is just a stepping stone I build my life on truth So I put on a mask every day Every day Until I'm smart enough, brave enough to go it alone Ooh, I'm on a lion street I didn't mean to be I'm hiding, I'm hiding, I'm hiding Everything about the real me I'm on a lion street didn't mean to be I'm hiding, I'm hiding, I'm hiding Everything about the real me Real me Thank you, friends. Yeah! Thank you so much. Wonderful. Those those keys that you can see but not hear are my MIDI keyboard, by the way. I uh, I play both things. <laughs> okay, this is um this is a song called Full Moon Charm Bracelet. It's the first track of my new album, Shadow Work, which is everywhere. If you want to hear it, it's on the Spotify's and the iTunes, and it's gonna be on vinyl. It's the first time I ever release something on vinyl. Um, that's a pre-order right now on my website. But um, if you enjoy it, please find me. Please seek me out. Please let me come sing to you. Again, I do a live stream every Monday night called Monday Night Muses. And um, I play around as much as I possibly can. That sounded dirty, but I meant it in a very wholesome way. <laughs> this is a song called Full Moon Charm Bracelet. And uh, it's about letting go, which I am very bad at. Scared or 
much Rory. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you for all the hard work you do in putting this together every year. I've watched a lot of them. <laughs> I've watched a lot of them come together. And I know how much goes in behind the scenes. Thank you. And like I said, you've been very generous with your time over the years. And I really, really appreciate it. I really enjoy every time I get to listen to you. <laughs> Yes, yes. So the audience, you were getting so many great comments. Mm -hmm. By the way, yeah. shout out to my friend Diggy Cat in the Facebook chat. That's him with the shocked cat emoji. <laughs> I, I just want you to know that here in the Zoom chat, Diggy Cat, we wrote out shocked cat emoji for you. <laughs> so we could see that comment. <laughs> great. That was awesome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yes, great. <laughs> Okay, um, all right, from speculative fiction comes Children of Fury, Dog Nation, Volume 3, by Rashid Darden, Old Gold Soul Press. For the children of Pomegranate Place, there is little difference between ordinary and extraordinary terror. Monsters have taken hold of this struggling neighborhood. A mysterious teacher Chiron Towers comes out of full of hiding to fulfill his timeless mission. Train an army that will fight the dark forces lurking beneath Washington streets. Young men and women ignored by the world and touched by unspeakable horror will be transformed in preparation for the battle against premortal evil. Rashid Darden is an award-winning best-selling novelist of the urban LGBT experience. He is an out black gay man who brings to his novels as well his own life a sense of thoughtful disruption. He is local to the District of Columbia and Conway, North Carolina. Hi Rashid, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm well, so happy you. to be here. So glad to have you. Thank you. Okay. Well, you have something for us? Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay, so, great. So as you heard, um, my novel, Children of Fury, is the story of an alternative school teacher, Kyron Towers, who mm -hmm. introduces his students to the supernatural. 21-year-old Delante Oaks, uh, one of his students, has escaped his father's house and now lives with his teacher, Mr. Towers. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. That's Kyron okay. pushed through the steel and glass double doors and turned to his left toward 14th Street. It was hot out, but not unbearable as it typically was. 
The trees which lined the street reminded him of home, which he hadn't seen in years. A tense, middle-aged man paced the sidewalk in front of him as he dragged on a cigarette. He looked at Chiron, looked at his phone, and looked up again. He exhaled and flicked the cigarette in the street as Chiron walked by. Hello, Chiron said politely. The man was silent. Chiron shrugged and the distance between them grew. He could hear the man slowly walking behind him, but made nothing of it, as Chiron could have easily knocked the man out in one blow. You're Mr. Towers, the man said. Chiron stopped, turned around, and looked at him. He was only about five feet, eight inches tall at best. Dark brown skin framed a round head and salt and pepper hair flecked his mustache and goatee. I am, Chiron said. The man's nervousness quickly transformed into an ugly rage. His eyes narrowed to slits and his mouth curled into a crooked frown. You the one been fucking around with my son. Chiron's heart raced. This was him. This was the son of a bitch that broke Delante and nearly ruined him. This was the man who would dare put his hands on his child in hate and not in love. I'm not fucking around with anyone's son. You, sir, are mistaken. Why so formal? You don't need to call me, sir. Mr. Oaks will do. Trevor, even better. Mr. Oaks, what you're looking for isn't here. Let's walk, Mr. Towers. I believe you're headed this way. Trevor Oaks pointed and smiled. He was missing a molar. Chiron began walking with the man. You're Delante's teacher, he continued. I am his favorite teacher. I don't know, <laughs> you are. Ever since you got to that school, you all he'd been able to talk about. And that's good, that's real good. I've been trying to get him to take an interest in school. He used to be real smart, you know. He is smart, very smart. Teachers loved him all through elementary school. He used to love being in the school plays. Then his mama died when he was 12. Shit went real left after that. Boy, when that depression get hold of you. Whew. And it don't look the same in little black boys. He needed a counselor, but they ain't know what to do with him. Just kept suspending him. And he got worse and worse. Can't even tell you how many high schools he went to. Six. He went to six high schools before alternative futures. Yeah, you right. They stopped walking at the corner in front of the Ethiopian coffee shop. Yeah, his teachers loved him before all that, but ain't none of them loved him like you do. So it seemed. What's your point, Mr. Oaks? I don't like the implication you're making here. Ain't no implication, buddy. And Delante, a grown ass man, just like you, just like me. He can do what he want to do. Know what I'm saying? Chiron stood stoically with his arms folded. A single bead of sweat rolled off his forehead and down his jaw. Mr. Towers, you fucking up the church's money. What church? Chiron scoffed. Relax, that's just a saying. Look, Delante stayed with you last night, right? Chiron was silent. Right, Mr. Oaks said. Thing is, I know where he be at all times. He don't know it, but I know it. That's why I don't worry about him. But when it comes to my money, I worry. What money, what are you talking about? <laughs> you really don't know, do you? Mr. Oaks laughed. I don't see the humor. Delante, a working boy. Them things he do with you for free, he get paid for everywhere else. Thank you. I'm gonna say the oh, one. <laughs> I'm gonna say the one word. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank oh you, my Donna. Goodness. 
I felt that. Oh, it was wonderful. I know you're going to, hopefully, I know you're going to put this into a play. I will please, see. We'll please see. Do. Please do. Because there's so much, there's so much energy there. And I felt, I said, yes, this got to be a play. Well, yes. there's, there's no limits. And, and thank you so much to, uh, to you and to Sheila and everybody else, all this talent that's assembled here today. This is just really inspiring. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you. Sheila. Oh, so, uh, no. Thank you, Donna. Um, okay, so now I'd like to announce two new programs, uh, the Bi Arts Group and the Bi Writers Conference. We have spent our first 15 years focused on writers. This event has always incorporated other arts, such as music, like Rory Kelly and Anne, and uh, art, which we'll be getting to, photography, and even drama. The Bi Arts Group is forming to include artists of every type, whether you are a writer of any kind, a visual artist of any kind, a musician, a dancer, anyone who is bi plus, pan, fluid, etc., anyone under the bisexual umbrella who is in the arts, can join this group. Uh, I don't have an agenda for this group. I just want to be in it and to start meeting other bi plus people in the arts. So if you want to join us for our first meeting, it'll be on Zoom on Saturday, July the 10th in the afternoon. We haven't narrowed down the time exactly yet because I'd like to know, you know, once you join, what time's good for you. Um, email us if you want to join, and I'll put my email in the chat. But you could also just go to our website at bywriters.org and go click on Write Us in the menu bar, and uh, that will pop up an email with this email address that goes straight to me. Okay, so... Our next season, starting in the fall, will be the 10th anniversary of the Bisexual Book Awards. And I wanted to do something special to celebrate. And there's something I've been thinking about since before the Bisexual Book Awards even existed. Um, and we were only the Bi Writers Association at that point. And, uh, what I've been thinking about is to hold a bi writers conference that will help writers improve their skills, help them get published, help them do their own publicity, and to hold readings and open mics all day. So now that we can hold this conference over Zoom, it becomes a lot more practical because writers tend to be broke. And most of us can't afford to, you know, fly across the country and stay in a hotel to attend a conference. So I know I can't. Um, and I've only started getting to go to buy conferences and art festivals and all that this past year again uh, because of this, you know, because we can do it this way. And I don't have to have money for airfare or somewhere to stay or a hotel and you know food and all that and so um it becomes a lot more practical so if you would like to join our conference planning committee our first meeting is next weekend on sunday june 20th if you'd like to join us shoot me an email and uh i'll just you know I'll email everyone so that you know how we're gonna hop on a Zoom link and, and have our meeting. Uh, so Donna, are you ready to introduce our next author? Yes, I am, Sheila. From our fiction category, we have All Adults Here by Emma Straub, Riverhead Books. When Astrid Strick witnesses a school bus accident in the center of town, it jostles loose a repressed memory from her young parenting days decades earlier. Suddenly, Astrid realizes she was not quite the parent she thought she's been. 
to her three now grown children. But to what consequence? Emma Straub is a New York Times bestselling author of three other novels, The Vacationers, <clears throat> excuse me, Modern Lovers, Laura's Lamont's Life in Pictures, and the short story collection, Other People We Married. Her books have been published in 20 countries. Awesome. She, she and her husband own Books Are Magic, an independent bookstore in Brooklyn, New York. I didn't know that go, girl. Emma, how you doing? Hi. <laughs> okay. So won't you um do a little bit of something for us? <laughs> I will, Donna. I also want to say hello to Garfield, who I've been admiring. Oh, the- my baby. Yes, this is Garfield. <laughs> this is his throne. It's Pride Month. Every now and then he said, I have to sit on the throne and say big fat hairy deal. That's it. <laughs> Um, thank you thank you donna and sheila and tony for having me um this has been a wonderful evening um i'm gonna do something totally crazy okay which uh jennifer declined to do earlier which is to read from the very end of my novel but you know what why not i'm gonna do it good (laughs) Um, a lot has happened at this point um Mm -hmm. and astrid who uh donna just described um is now on a she's on a honeymoon cruise and we're going to join her there uh there was so much that astrid hadn't considered getting married again having someone to co-parent co-pilot co-grandparent what a thing to do to skip having children and go straight to being a grandparent birdie was magnificent at it of all the adults she was the best at dancing baby eleanor to sleep Maybe it was her arms, strong from decades of steady scissor holding. Maybe it was just that Astrid had used up her powers on her own children. Maybe it was that Eleanor and Bertie were fast friends. Astrid hadn't thought of herself as one of those people who just wanted to be married. But now that she was, she was so delighted all over again. The word wife, which had once felt oppressive, diminutive, belittling, She thought of all the times she'd been introduced simply as Russell's wife with no additional qualifying details, nothing so brash as a name. Now the word wife meant something else. It wasn't Russell's fault, it was the world's. Now that it was a double, your wife, my wife, the word felt twice its original size. That was how it was supposed to feel. It wasn't just that she belonged to someone else, it was that she belonged. Sometimes Astrid thought about everything in her life that could have been different. All the men and women she could have married, having her children or not having any children at all, moving to Paris, she and Russell dying in bed together at 100 years old. She thought about how every decision of hers had rippled into her children's lives, even this one, when she was still their mother every day, but not actually in charge of their lives. People said that everyone was born alone and that everyone would die alone, but they were wrong. When someone was born, they brought so many people with them, generations of people zipped into the marrow of their tiny bones. She reached under the bolted down desk and took took Bertie's hand and it felt just the way it had felt on their first date. Astrid had still been young then, though she hadn't known it. Was it like that until you died, always realizing how young you'd been before, how foolish and full of possibility? Astrid hoped so. Outside, sunlight sparkled off the surface of the water as if the ocean wanted to show the sky exactly how astonishing it was. Every day was a new day. She would call Cecilia later and Wendy and the boys, her whole family. She'd call them until they were sick to death with love, just like she was. Astrid looked at their reflections on the blank screen at herself and her wife and felt so, so happy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Emma. That was awesome. I loved it. It was great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Our last reading of the night, but not the end of the program. Okay, comes from teen young adult, also referred to as Yah, Who I Was With Her by Nita Tindall, Harper Teen, Harper Collins. There uh, are two 
Yes, Sheila, talk Sorry. to me. That was YA. YA, yeah. I said, what? Well, young, young adult. I said, yeah, it says yeah. I saw the capital yeah. I said, okay, yeah. <laughs> or YA, okay. Um, Corinne Parker knows to be true that she's in love with Maggie Bailey, the captain of the rival high school cross country team and her secret girlfriend of the year, of a year. And that she isn't ready for anyone to know she's bisexual. But when Maggie dies, Corinne has to deal with her grief on her own until she meets Alyssa, Maggie's ex, and a single person who understands how Corinne is feeling. Nita Tyndall is a queer advocate and literary translator from North Carolina who writes the kinds of books we need, they need in high school. Cool. They are a part of the they were part of the Lambda Literary Writers Retreat in 2017. You can find them on social media at Nita Tyndall, who I was with her is her is their debut. Hey Nita, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? Okay. So won't you bring us a little bit of what you got? I'd like to hear it. <laughs> Thanks. It's my headphones actually. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so the book is told in a nonlinear format, so oh. starting with after Maggie died and then flashing back to scenes of her and Corinne's relationship. Wow. So I'm going to be reading one of the flashback scenes as those tend to be a lot happier than the cool. current present day scenes. All right, sounds cool. <laughs> Nine months before. She invites me over after Christmas so we can hang out. I tell her I'll come after I visit my mom. Separated parents should mean twice the presents, but it doesn't. Just a nice Christmas with my dad and one with my mom that feels like an afterthought. It's a balmy 60 when I pull into Maggie's driveway, which shouldn't be allowed. Winters in Colorado mean heaps of snow and cold icy wind in your lungs. Winters in North Carolina, I've come to learn, can either mean an inch of snow that shuts the whole state down or almost spring-like weather. Today feels like spring. I'm in a dress I dug out from the back of my closet I wore last year to Julia's birthday. Three quarter sleeves in a soft pink color. I don't know why I've dressed up to come over to her house. This is only the second time I've seen her since I told her I broke up with Trent. She called me later that night to talk about it, asked if I was feeling okay. I said yes. I was the one who broke it off after all, the way I have with every other boy. She said good, she was happy for me. We didn't talk much after that, but when I hung up, there were knots in my stomach. I've been thinking about it more and more, about her more and more, about what it would be like to be with her, what it means if it has to mean anything. What if it's just Maggie? What if I'm only attracted to her? What does that mean? Does it have to mean anything? Fuck, <laughs> I wish I had someone to talk to about this. But if I tell Julia, if I talk to her, that will make it mean something, and I'm not ready for that yet. Maggie's house is huge, certainly bigger than mine. She has a front porch and columns, old school Southern charm. There are no cars in the driveway except hers, but I try not to think about that. She opens the door and immediately hugs me, curly hair pulled back in a ponytail. She's in a t-shirt and a pair of shorts that must have been her brother's. Hi, she says, pulling back and tucking a stray strand of hair behind her ear, her face suddenly red. Did... Did you have a good Christmas? Yeah, I say. I don't look directly at her, and she looks down at her feet. I'm still standing on her porch. Can I come in? I ask, and she laughs nervously. Yeah. Come on, let me show you around. She doesn't, though. We pass by grand rooms, and she just tosses out what they are. Kitchen, living room, dad's office. We stop at the door to her basement, her bonus room, as she calls it. The second we step in, I immediately understand why she calls it that. It's not a basement like at my house, concrete floor and boxes from when we moved. It's got a carpet, a couch, a pool table, and a large TV with a crap ton of video games. I follow her down the stairs. Does it embarrass her having all this stuff? It would embarrass me, but she seems almost comfortable in it. That's the thing about her. She's comfortable in any environment. Running, coffee with me. She's at ease, all smiles and charm, and I'm the girl standing awkwardly to the side who doesn't know what to do with her hands. Sure, I'm not that way at school where I know my place with the girls on the team by Julia's side, but put me somewhere unfamiliar, forget it. Maggie sits down on the couch, tucks her feet up under her and begins fiddling with the remote. So, um, get anything nice for Christmas? I ask as I sit down on the opposite end of the couch. She shrugs. 
when you're running stuff mostly you i shrug um dad got me some stuff from colorado you can only find there snacks and stuff do you miss it she asks earnestly looking at me with wide eyes like she really wants to know she leans forward and i look up at her for the first time and my gaze immediately lands on her lips what am i doing a girl is sitting in front of me and i like her and i don't have a boyfriend and I'm sitting here talking about Christmas like it's the most important thing in the world. And there is a whole freaking couch cushion between us and I want to kiss her. Sometimes I say and look down at my hands at her purple couch because if I don't, the couch squeaks as it shifts and I look up and she's moved so she's sitting right next to me. And I, I'm staring at her lips again. Corinne, she says, and her voice is soft and hesitant and unsure. And I lean forward and kiss her before I won't let myself take the chance anymore. It's quick, a barely there kiss, but my heart beats frantically like it's trying to come out of my chest. Her eyes meet mine. I can't read them, can't read her expression because the only thing I'm thinking right now is I kissed her, I kissed her, I kissed her. And then she leans forward and kisses me back. Yes, yes, wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nita. <laughs> that was great. Okay, Sheila. Uh, okay, I just, I'm looking, I'm just trying to pull up something that I'm going to need for in memoriam, which is what we're doing next, because we recently lost two authors who were you know, close to this program. They had both read from their books on our program. Well, one on, on the by writers, the very first by writers uh, bisexual book awards and the other one before we had the book awards when we were just doing the readings uh, for, for by authors who were coming in from the, for the Lammies, uh, you know, because they now have, we lobbied them to have a by book category. So um, I just want to see if I can pull up. My computer is old and slow and it doesn't want to cooperate right now. Uh, come on. While you do that, I'll pull up the in memoriam, in memoriam slideshow. What? Go do the slideshow. Slideshow. I mean, I'm trying to put, pull up my page for LinkedIn, and it's just, uh, I don't know, there's like a blue thing going back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, and nothing is happening. Well, while it's load, let's do the first person. Okay. Um, people who we recently lost who were really a part of our bisexual book awards family were basil papa dame Oh, God. Come on. I think we need another sponsor to get us a computer. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we lost Basil Papademos, also known as Baz. It's his nickname, author of the winner for erotic fiction, Mount Royal. There's nothing.
Harder Than Love, which was in our very first annual Bisexual Book Awards, and Ellis Avery, author of the finalist book, The Last Nude, for fiction, also from our first awards. Um, I don't connect with every author who is in our awards, um, more so with the authors who are on our program. But these two were special. First of all, I loved the books. Secondly, we had a bond. Third, as I mentioned, they were on our program. Um, I first met Ellis Avery at the Rainbow Book Fair here in New York, which unfortunately doesn't seem to exist anymore. But I was going around to all the tables asking if they had any bisexual books. And Ellis responded that she didn't have one now, but she was writing a novel based on the famous Art Deco artist Tamara Delumbica, who was also famously bisexual, which got me very excited. Our conversation became so intense that she revealed to me that she was fighting cancer. And I remember thinking, I hope nothing dire happens before she finishes the book, because no one else was writing a book like that. No one else was writing about Tamara Dilemka and her artwork, her life, and it could be an important addition to the bisexual canon. Tony, Tony, can we please turn that off? The music? Yes. I was having a hard time talking over it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I wanted that book to become part of the bisexual canon because it fills a hole that existed at the time. And it's a good thing I jumped the gun and invited her to read from The Last Nude in a bylines reading the year before the first Bisexual Book Awards. And that her book was ultimately entered in. But the next year she wasn't available to come back to be on our program and we would have missed her if I hadn't have been so anxious to get her, get her in. So I, I should probably mention that Ellis Avery was a lesbian, but she provided an important book about a bisexual artist and her bisexual model who became a celebrity through being Delempica's model. And the book is from her point of view, actually, the model. So um, Ellis Avery is the only writer ever to have received the American Library Association Stonewall Award for fiction twice. Avery is the author of two novels, a memoir and a book of poetry. Her novels, The Last Nude from Riverhead in 2012 and The Tea House Fire, also from Riverhead in 2006 have also received Lambda, Ohio, Ohioana, and Golden Crown Awards. And her work has been translated into six languages. Six languages. <laughs> I think most of our books are only in one language. I know mine is. So um, she also taught fiction writing at Columbia University and uh, We'll get her website address in the chat. You have that, Tony, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So I wanna read this little part from Wikipedia um, and you'll see why. Uh, this is about Basil. Basil Papademos was a Canadian writer he is best known for his 2012 novel, Mount Royal, which won the award for best erotic novel at the 2013 Bisexual Book Awards and was a nominee in the novels category at the 2013 Relit Awards. Uh, born September 29th, 1957, um, which means that he was one year 
younger than me um, in Toronto, Canada, a place where I lived for five and a half years and died May 16th, 2020. So roughly a year ago um, from COVID. <sighs> and uh, it's a funny story. Just want to see if I can get that conversation pulled up now. Is this me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, after Basil won the award for erotic fiction, um, after hanging around in New York for a while, he went back up to Canada, which is where he, you know, where he was born. And I guess he wanted to go visit some friends and family. And he gets to the Canadian border and uh, the customs officers there were, you know, open his bag and there sitting on top is his award for erotic fiction. And they took one look at that and they decided he was a pornographer. So then they start hunting through his laptop and his phone and he had been living in Thailand where lady boys are very popular and he was dating a few of them and they sent him sexy pics, which he had on his computer and maybe his phone. So then they just really decided he was a pornographer and possibly a sex trafficker and uh, so he was detained there for hours. Eventually they let him go, but they kept all his devices. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until a few days later that they contact, you know, they went through everything with their software and eyes or whatever, grubby little hands. And uh, they, they called him and told him that he could come and pick it up. So then, you know, another two, two and a half hour trip to the border and then the same back. Um, at least that's how long it takes from Toronto. I'm not sure how long from Montreal, it might be longer. So, um, oh, and he mi had missed his uh, train because of his being detained. So he had to buy a new ticket. It was a lot of aggravation, but um, and then I, I wrote an article about it for my column that I had at the time in the Examiner. And uh, I also wrote another article with him where I interviewed him about his book. So um, I don't know if there's some way we can get those up on our website somewhere. I don't know. We, we, we use the Wayback Machine online to find them because that website doesn't exist anymore. But, um, okay, so I wanted to read to you, Basil and I had, you know, we used to communicate back and forth um, from time to time. And um, so I wanted to read some of that to you. And so uh, I, you know how LinkedIn always tells you, oh, it's someone's anniversary or they got a new job. So I wrote, uh, congratulations on your new position. And Basil wrote back, hey, Sheila, thanks. Hope things are going great, Baz. And so I wrote, wow, Canada Council for the Arts, that's a big deal. What is your position there? Are you back in Canada or do you not need to be in the country? Hi, Sheila, not sure why it shows up as a job. I got a grant from CC, I guess that's some Canadian thing, to finish a novel I've been writing about working for a US NGO in Greece 
during the massive refugee wave caused by years of Western imperialist wars. No drugs this time and only sex is the result of human trafficking, the victimized women and kids. No title yet. I was funded for a year to give me time to do this. I guess word got around because an agency called the Rights Factory is asking if I have a rep. But I've got to finish writing the things first. So how are you doing? What's happening? I've been living in North Thailand, working on a couple projects here, but I'm moving to Athens in a couple months. Let me know what you're up to. XO, 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 Baz. Canada is great with arts grants. Wish it was the same here. Why are you moving to Athens? Sounds intriguing. XO Sheila. Hi, sorry for delay in replying. I've been up at Thai Myanmar border working at a couple refugee camps. No headlines ever, but civil war in Myanmar continues in some locales on a low turf fight type level. This was be before everybody knew what was going on. I mean, now everybody knows, but um, basically drug lords that press gang villagers to fight for them or process narcotics. The refugee issue in Greece is growing again, and there's a big Euro NGO that's asked if I want to work there since I speak Greek and my family is from the region where the refugees are crossing. Wish I was in New York to go out to a decent non-hetero bar. Hope you're well, darling. XOXO Baz. Sounds fascinating, although horrible. Everyone is wondering what is going on in Myanmar. So very topical. Besides the news, Myanmar comes up a lot on the shopping channels because they just got Burmese rubies and jade back in because, well, never mind, because they lifted the embargo that was on there for like, I don't know, eight years or something. And now another embargo is sure to hit. Good luck with your new job and your novel. I hope it's something that can be submitted to the Bisexual Book Awards, of course, but if not, good luck anyway. No, no consensuals in this one, but some stuff about how groomers and recruiters would approach lone kids in the camps to get them away from the place, and then they're lost in Europe's human trafficking networks. It's profoundly evil stuff and hard to think about. Sometimes you just don't want to know. The Rohingya situation is pretty sickening. Western powers and installed Aung San Sun Si, and she was supposed to bring the new enlightenment, but she barely said a word about the genocide. The whole story is beyond depraved. I may actually, I may actually stop in Toronto and NYC on my way to Greece. If I do, let's try to meet up for a drink. I miss the States in a way, the mix of ideas and people well, in certain places. Thailand is bizarre. They're so officially prim and moral, yet it's a sex tourist paradise. Money first, I guess. I would love to get that drink with you. Hope you can make it here. Just let me know when. Will do. Basil, I tried to friend you on FB and it appears you are dead. Please tell me that was some other Basil. The last name was one letter off, but Toronto and Montreal were mentioned, but no mention of your books or Thailand. You supposedly died of COVID. Not sure if it's you. Please tell me it's not. So before this event, I went on and I tried to friend all of the authors who had been on our program for the last eight years and the ones, you know, from this year. And um, so that's how I found out about both of them is that, you know, trying to friend them on FB and seeing, finding, finding this out. <laughs> which was a real shock. And because uh, you're both, you know, so young to be dead. And, you know, they were both so talented. And I feel that, you know, they could have written so many 
more books. And uh, Ellis was also a writing teacher at university. I think I, we might've mentioned that. Um, and the, obviously the work Basil was doing, which I should have mentioned previously. I mean, the book that he put out that we had well, you know, it was it won erotic fiction, but it was a book all about sex and drugs in Montreal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a ragtag kind of group of friends who were living sort of on the margins and, uh, but had like a really beautiful kind of um, connection with each other. And, uh, So, you know, the work that he was talking about on LinkedIn is not necessarily what you would expect from someone who's writing about sex and drugs. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, he was a many faceted person. So, um, okay. I guess that's it for that which means that we're announcing who won awards. Tony? Did we ever get the violin music or are we proceed? So let's, before we do awards, let's all take like a quick three minute intermission. We'll look at some art oh, yeah. from, um, from the book Ceremonials. I'll put on some Ma Rainey and we'll and we'll be right back in three minutes for the book awards. Yay. All right. Thank you, Tony.
All right, and we're back. <clears throat> Sheila, what I get? Uh, you welcome everybody back. We are now moving on to the uh, annual, the ninth annual by book awards portion of the evening. Um. I can't find a script now because I just realized there's a couple announcements we didn't make yet. Are they ones that can... All right, let's make it fast. Well, why don't you talk about the Australia uh, Bicon that we went to and they're doing it again in 2021. But I have to find where the information is. As to the date. It's called Stand By Us. Right. And it's September 18th through September 27th. And I'll put that in the chat. And if you want more information, go to the website. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to go to, uh, we're going to tell you who the winners are of the awards. You are going to be the first to know. Why is my screen not wanting to cooperate? Why is this not going? Okay. Um, well, I guess I'll have to read it off the screen because my list, I can't see it in the screen at the same time. You know, the list is a lot easier okay. to deal with. We got this second time's a try. Okay. Okay, so starting with the nonfiction category. We've got bisexual and pansexual identities, exploring and challenging invisibility and invalidation by Nikki Hayfield uh, from Rutledge. And we have bisexuality in Europe Sexual Citizenship, Romantic Relationships, and Bi Plus Identities, edited by Emil Melpard and Renata Baumgartner, also from Rutledge. And we have, by the way, Pastoring Bisexual Christians in Europe by Carol A. Shepard. And the winner is. Bisexuality in Europe. Congratulations to Emil and Ren Renata. Why am I seeing Rory? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sheila. Yay. <laughs> 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 Right there, you see it? I can't tell because it's not showing me it. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, right. Sheila. Thank this you is so much. This is award. And it says Bisexual Book Awards winner, nonfiction. I guess you'll have to share custody. <laughs> Maybe, Renata, you can have it for the first six months and Emil can have it. Exactly. Just <laughs> go Thank you. Thank you all. Tony, would you like to do the next one, Memoir Biography? Sure. So the next category is, uh, we've got Memoir, Biography, and Finalists. First, we've got The Fixed Stars, a memoir by Molly Weisenberg, Weisenberg, uh, I don't 
see who the publisher is. Abrams Press. Then we've got Frida in America by Celia Starr, St. Martin's Press, and Macmillan. We've got Rust Belt Femme by Rachel Angeli, Belt Publishing. Okay. And the winner is... The Fixed Stars by Molly Weisenberg, Abrams Press. You bury your soul, you get an award. <laughs> how it works here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Donna? Yeah, yeah. Can you, oh, here, here's your award. Right here. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much, Sheila, for organizing all of this. Um, it is a real honor. Thank you. We can make arrangements to get that. <laughs> all right. Donna, you ready? Donna? what we have who are we announcing here okay the fiction finalists yep oh wow okay um the first one i see is emma straub all adults here and the next one is ceremonials by katherine Cold iron. Cold iron. Cold iron. Okay. Um, the next one is the comp. I can't see the. I can't. The company the daughters. Okay, the company daughters, by Samantha Raja. Did I say Raharam. that right? Rajat Rajaram. Raharam. Raharam. Okay. Um. Jennifer Style or Steel? Style. Exile Music. Okay. Jennifer Style, a novel, Exile Music. And Starling Days by, I can't read, the, um, it's being blocked. The, it's by who? Rowan, Rowan Sayo Buchanan. Okay. Rowan Sayo Buchanan. And you exist too much. Okay, and this is by by the missing Zaina Arafat. Okay. The name Arafat. Okay, and the fiction, the award goes to da 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 All Adults Here by Emma Straub. <laughs> Publishers of the books. Yay! Emma, come on down. You are a winner. Congratulations. Thank you. This is very surprising. I and honestly, you love my Garfield. He said you will going to win. Go ahead now. <laughs> you know, Garfield, um, I've never won anything uh, before in my whole life. So thank you to Garfield, first and foremost. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> well, Garfield, thanks you as well. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to say? What was a little more that got it? You're, you guys are allowed to give a short speech. I forgot to mention that. <clears throat> <laughs> I won. I won. My, my audience is um, coming to see what the commotion is about. Um, <laughs> Honestly, it, it never, it never, it truly never occurred to me that I would win. Um, this is, I mean, this is so much fun. Molly, I like my pal Molly. I feel like we're in a, an, an amazing club now. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel at a loss for words, which has truly never happened to me before. Um, <laughs> the best things that have never happened to me before. So thank you. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, Sheila. Oh, it's my turn again. Okay. 
by the way, Tony put together this whole thing. That's great. Uh, yeah, let's do the finalists. Okay, romance finalists. Where are we going? Who's first? Off Balance, A Painted Bay Story by Jay Hogan. Darkest Skies, no. Redemption, Darkest Skies, it must be some kind of series. Garrett Lee. The Secret of You and Me, Melissa Lenhart. The Sex Coach, Garrett Lee. The Woman Who Fell Through Time. Fell, oh, yeah. Hmm. Jam Frey. Jam Frey. And the winner is. Match it, match it. Off Balance by Jay Hogan. Yay! Southern Lights publish it. Jay, are you here? Uh, no, Jay nope. was not uh, able to be on our program. Okay. Uh, we did. We did invite Jay, but they weren't All able right. to be on the program. Dates conflicting, etc. Okay, so, Tony, you're up now. next is erotic fiction. Uh, there were not enough books to declare finalists, so we have an honorable mention. Bottle Rocket by Aaron McLean. Mc McClellan. McClellan. Independently published. Mm. Right. See this new logo here? With the three, the three books mm -hmm. and the, the award, Tony and I worked on that together. Mm. Yeah. Uh, speculative fiction finalists. Okay. We've got Architects of Memory by Karen Osborne. Children of Fury, Dark Nation Volume 3, Old Gold Soul Press. By Rashid Darn. By Rashid Darn. Uh, the Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab, Tor Books, Tom Dirty, Dirty Associations Division of Macmillan Publishers, Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth, William Morrow, hyper, published by William Morrow, Harper Collins. Uh, Queen of Noise by Lee Harlem, Harlan, by Neon Hemlock Press. And the winner is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab, publisher Yay. of Four Books, Tom Darty, Associates Division of Macmillan Publishers. Yay. Yes. Uh... V.E. Schwab was not available on this date, so uh, we will let them know. All right. When. Donna, do you want to do young uh, adult fiction and teen? Sure, why not? Okay. Category teen young adult fiction finalists. The first one, Gabrielle Harboy, Harboy. Harboy, hearts are jerks. Gabrielle, hearts are jerks. Look, just because you see me doesn't mean you know me. A novel by Zan Romanoff. Only Mostly Devastated by Sophie Gonzalez. Who I Was With Her by Nita Tindall. You Should See Me in the Crown by Leah Johnson. 
And the winner is for Young Teen Young Deduction Fiction is Oh, who I who I was with her by Nina Tindall. Congratulations. Oh, yay. Uh -uh. You. you go, Nita. 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 Thanks, Thank you. guys. <laughs> Wonderful. You Congratulations, Nita. Thank you. I'd like to say something. <laughs> Look, I was like fully not prepared. I was sitting here thinking, man, I really loved it. You should see me in a crown. I'm wondering if it's going to win. Hey, here's your award. Oh, thank you. This is so exciting. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, I, I literally had nothing prepared, so okay. <laughs> thanks, y'all. Congratulations. Thank you. Yay. <sighs> All right, Sheila, you can do mystery. Okay. Let's see what's happening here. Oh, mm. there were no mystery finalists, which is a great mystery. <laughs> but only a winner. So let's see who the winner is. And the winner is The Better Liar by Tannen Jones. Wow. Thank you, guys. Uh, I, I really appreciate um, the invitation to be here. And it is such an honor to be among so many wonderful writers. I, I love listening to your excerpts and your songs. Um, thank you so much. Congrats, yay! Oh, so much going right. on in the chat, I can't keep up. <laughs> Poetry. So am I doing this? Yeah, do it. Okay. So, okay, the poetry finalists are again by Jennifer. Hold on, it's been covered up. It's, no. Perrine. No. <laughs> Jennifer <laughs> Perrine. Things are popping up there. Okay. Who's next? Crown Noble by Bianca Phipps. And Magnolia Canopy Otherworld by, oh, sorry, I couldn't. By Aaron Carlisle. The name was so small, I couldn't really read it. Okay. And who will the winner be? The poetry winner is Crown Noble, Crown Noble. by Bianca Phipps. Yay! Of Button Poetry. We had someone else here from Button Poetry not too long ago. It was very good. So uh, congratulations. Mm -hmm. OK, who wants to do this one? I'll do I'll it. I'll do it. Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Are you sure? Yep. OK. Um, the publisher of the year finalists, Macmillan, Macmillan Penguin Random House. Sorry. Okay. I got behind. <laughs> okay. Publisher of the Year, Ninth Annual Bisexual Book Award winner is Ta -ta -da -da. Macmillan. Macmillan. Woo! Yay. Yeah, we uh, base this on a few things. One is how many books did you submit to our awards? Oh. Not yet. What? Oh, sorry. We're going back. <laughs> how many books are you submit to our awards? Uh, how many are finalists and winners? And also, how do you treat your authors, if we know oh. anything about that? So um, based on that information, McMillan was the winner. And I'll be letting them know. Great. Okay. All right, Sheila. I'm doing the next <laughs> This one is mine. <laughs> okay, by writer of the year, finalists. Now we have like one, before we start, the reason we have this award is as you notice during this uh, program, 
that not only bisexual people are writing bi bisexual books, bi themed books. They could be straight, they could be gay, they could be lesbian. And so we wanted to have one special award that we knew would be going to a bi writer and um, someone who exemplifies our three criteria and who is a great writer and who digs deep. So here we go. Nikki Hayfield, Bisexual and Pansexual Identities from Rutledge. Jay Hogan, Off Balance, uh, who wrote Off Balance, a painted bay story. Samantha Irby, uh, who wrote Wow, No Thank You, which is a collection of her humorous essays. Mm. It's very funny. Um, Emile Malacord and Renata Baumgartner, again. Bisexuality uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, Samantha Rajaram for Company Daughters. Celia Starr for Frida in America. Jennifer Style for Exile Music. And Nita Tyndall for Who I Was With Her. And Molly Weisenberg for The Fixed Stars. <coughs> and the by writer of the year is Molly Weisenberg, oh. The oh. Fixed Stars from Abram Prep. This is all very surprising. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm sitting here with a bag of potato chips. It's been a delightful evening. Um, thank you so much, Sheila. And thank you, Tony. Thank you, Donna. Um, I'm just blown away. Thank you so much. Um, I feel so lucky to have been able to put this book out into the world and tell the story of my experience. Um, and anyway, congratulations to all of us who are here and who've been nominated. I loved celebrating with all of you. Well, congratulations. I mean, this is our biggest award of the year. And, um, for us, it's a big deal. I, you know, decide who the finalists and the winner should be in consultation with other judges what they've picked, but also my own opinions. And, uh, you know, I felt like in this book, you really, I mean, there were so many great books. As you can see, I had a large field of finalists, but, you know, you, it was really hard to choose. You know, I wanted to have multiple winners, but, you know, your book, you really, you really went deep. You know, you were so self revealing and, you know, I think that memoirs are sometimes the best way to help people understand bisexuality and to be able to, you know, relate it to a book to what they're going through in their life and in their thoughts. And, uh, you know, I really felt you, you really took a risk, you know, and you, you just kept going. And I really, you know, appreciate that. It's something that we need, but most of us are unable to do, you know? <laughs> so, um, 
Congratulations. Oh, thank you. That means the world. And um, yeah, I just feel really lucky to get to do it and to have had a publisher and an editor who supported me in telling that truth. So thank you. All right. Yay. So, I congratulations think to everybody. Yes, congratulations, everybody. Congratulations. To the winners, to the finalists. Congratulations. And thank you so much, you know, for to all our performers for uh, being on our program and for making this evening so special. Mm -hmm. You know, after last year's one, which we we recorded this, right, Tony? Yeah. Okay, so I I watched the last one like three or four times that we did in in September, not our usual time of year due to COVID, but um, you know because when I'm doing it, you know I'm organizing everything, so part of my head is on that, and it's so great for me to be able to relax and watch the whole thing and have my full attention on it. Um, so I'm really happy that we're able to make this recording and, uh, you know, to be able to see it a few more times. Yeah. So before we head out for the night, we've got some quick thank yous that we want to shout out. Um, thanks to all of our judges, <laughs> Pamela Auchenbach, uh, Louise Barr and Drake, uh, Alyssa Clark, Laura Cotton, AJ Dolman, Doug Dow, Eliza Edwards, Shelly Fien, Elizabeth Fernandez, Laura Foley, uh, Heron Greensmith, um, Marie Hart Hartong, uh, Jacob Hofstetler, Gwen Katz, Amanda Lester, Amy Lutgen, Hannah McCann, Katina Noble, Peacemaker, Evan Peterson, Samantha Pias, Pearl Perry, Mark Papare, Jessica Ruffield, Liam Rogers, Pepper Salmon, Sarah Spilsbury, Natalie Strobe, Kanaka Ko Su Sua, Lila Suzanne, Olivia Tompkins, Liz Wheeler, Olivia Wood, and Laura Zielinski. Uh, a special thanks also to Tony Johnson, to Val Griffin, to Donna Red. Catherine Gladhart Hayes and Nicholas Medina. So, from the By Writers Association to all everybody watching on YouTube and Facebook, thank you and have a lovely evening. For those still, for those of you writers, we'd like to take a, another shot of everybody before we head out. Have a good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. See you next year. Love you all. Yes. All right. So if everybody in the Zoom were off. Yeah. Yep, we're done. We're off YouTube and we're off Facebook. So let's do the photo. This view. Everybody turn your smile. camera on. Let's see your beautiful smile. Let me make sure I'm not spotlighted. <laughs> All right, everybody ready? Yep. All right, one, two, three. <laughs>